Okay, thank you for joining us. Um, my name's Eric Baber. I'm with Cambridge University Press, and along with Gordon Lewis, we'll be doing a joint presentation. Um, Gordon, perhaps I could hand over to you first to say a few words about your institution, and then we can talk about how we fit in together. Sure. Do I have a microphone as well? Can you hear me? Good. Yeah, my name's Gordon Lewis. I'm the um, uh, Vice President for Languages of the Laureate Network of Universities. Um, you probably haven't heard of uh, Laureate, but uh, our universities under their own names are in 26, 27 countries around the world. Um, and uh, we have about 1.2 million students uh, a large majority of them who are um, obviously learning English as part of their studies. Okay, thank you. So together, um, Laureate Universities and Cambridge University Press have been w working on developing and delivering blended courses. Um, that partnership spans back more than five years now. Um, and we've, this talk is about um, the latest joint experiment that we've done, if you like, um, and, and some of the research that we've performed around it. So, what we did was deliver a fully online course. Um, there's been a lot of talk for years about blended learning. This is still blended learning, or we would consider it blended learning, but with a slight difference. Traditional blended learning, if you like, is part face-to-face -face in the classroom and partly online, whereby, whereby the online component is usually the students studying um, online by themselves in isolation, if you like. What this research project was about was effectively replacing the face-to-face -face component with a synchronous online component. So at certain times of the week and for a certain number of hours, two hours, three hours per week, whatever, and we'll talk about the parameters, the students and a teacher would meet online. Online lessons would take place effectively to replicate or mimic or achieve similar goals as the face-to-face -face classroom would do in a normal face-to-face -face environment. And then in addition, the students would still um, do some asynchronous self-study around the online synchronous lessons. The asynchronous study, so that's the self-study component, took place in the Cambridge Learning Management System using um, one of our courses, Touchstone Online, while the synchronous lessons took place um, in one of two technologies, one of them is called Zoom, the other one was called Blackboard Collaborate. They have slightly different functionality, but overall have the same purpose and operate in very similar ways. People can log in together at the same time. They have a whiteboard or a screen sharing functionality. Um, the, the teacher can, can speak, all of the students can speak, and it's multi-way audio, so everybody can hear each other. Um, perhaps even see each other if they have webcams as well. So that's how the lessons took place. The study um, ended up um, with involvement of two Laureate institutions. One, UPC, based in, in Peru. Um, and, and this is a, a physical university, so that, as I say, it's, it's based there. Um, and a second one, Laureate Languages Online, which is effectively a virtual online language school, which is not directly affiliated to any of the physical universities. So I'm looking at Gordon for confirmation. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, and what, we, what we've done in the Laureate Online um, is taken t uh, teachers from across our network um, and then trained them up to deliver courses um, to multiple um, institutions at one time, as opposed to just one, like uh, we have at UPC. That, that difference, by the way, manifested itself in some of the research findings we feel. We'll come to that later. In total, 116 lessons were recorded, taught by 34 teachers from across the network, as Gordon says. And they were between 2 and 11 students who took part in each of the lessons. There were lessons with fewer than 2 students, i.e. with 1 student, um, but those were not evaluated as part of this piece of research. All of those teachers had previously received training in how to do online teaching, how to deliver online synchronous lessons. And just one final point there. Those lessons were then evaluated um, by Laura Patsko, who is here in the, in the front row, and she'll be fielding all of the really difficult questions at the end of this session. 
and um, Christopher Johnson, part of the Laureate Network, and the criteria by which those lessons were evaluated, Gordon is going to speak to next. Right, and I'd like to also mention that the teacher trainers, um, Janet Biancini and Carol Rainbow, are here in this room right now, and one of our teachers on this project, Robel, are you here? Um, uh, if Robel is here, raise your hand. There he is up there. He's actually one of the teachers who participated in this, um, in this study. So, oops. So, um, first of all, the lessons were evaluated by four researchers, led by Laura and Chris. And what we did was we recorded all of the synchronous sessions, and then basically they sat down arduously and uh, <laughs> basically looked and held a clicker and tried to um, identify the different types of interactions that took place um, in, these, in these synchronous environments. So we were looking at different forms of student talking time, so student to teacher, student to student, and then of course students to students as well. Um, we also had breakout rooms, and unfortunately the technology did not allow us um, to record the breakout rooms at this time. We're very happy to say that in the next, uh, next round of this um, uh, research, we do have access to these um, breakout rooms, and we'll be looking at them as well. But what we did was we assumed anywhere where there was a, break uh, a breakout room that student interaction did take, did take place, but we weren't able to I I identify exactly what that was. Here you can see basically the, um, uh, the spreadsheets that were, were developed and, um, and, and, and the procedure by which they were um, being, being keyed in. Uh, here you can see then again um, uh, some of the way, the way it looked when we had the results. Um, LULS, uh, if you look on the, um, on, on the left here, LULS is the Laureate Online Language School. You have the date, you have the level of the, of, of, of the class, um, number of students, and then, then as you can see, the, um, uh, the variety of interactions and the totals on the, uh, on the other side. So just, just to point out that those numbers are uh, seconds, is that right, Laura? Okay, percentage of lesson time to, uh, dedicated to those interaction times, uh, interaction types. Mm -hmm. Right, so let's go into the research results because I know we're, we have a short period here. Um, one thing we saw is that there appears to be a positive relationship between the week of the course and the amount of student interaction. So in other words, you know, as the um, students and the teachers become more familiar with uh, the platform or the task type, they become more willing to engage and speak um, within these uh, synchronous classrooms. Another thing I'd like to add on the, onto this is something that um, uh, is uh, on the side of the research is that we introduced a zero week in these courses. And what I mean by that is that the, um, the, the students and the teachers interacted for one week simply doing tasks that were similar to what they would have to do when they're producing language, but just doing them without the language input first in order to familiarize themselves with the, um, uh, with the platform before they had to, uh, to actually engage in coursework. Um, the more students there are in class, the more student, to student interaction appears to take place. Now these classrooms went up to about, could, could manage about 20 students per class. Um, in fact, and Laura, you can comment on this, we were not seeing 20 students in, in, in the classes for the most part. Um, one of the reasons for this was that in, in the one cohort at UPC, it was not obligatory to attend the synchronous sessions. But what we did see is that you have to have a certain critical mass of students in a classroom in order to, um, uh, to generate the kind of interaction that we were looking for. Um, this may seem obvious, but there seems to be more student-to-student -student interaction the higher the student's language level is. And of course, I think that, make, that, that makes sense also. The diversity of task at the higher levels is such that I think it's more motivating to, to try and express yourself there. And of course, at the lower levels, um, the, the teacher would have to be much more directive. Uh, the amount of student-to-student -student interaction is significantly different between the two institutions. Yes, and this is because the cohorts were quite different. The UPC cohorts were students at the university. The Laureate Online Language School cohorts were faculty and staff of multiple universities. 
But what might be interesting for you and significant is, to, is, is the fact that not so much um, uh, uh, what their profile is, but the fact that in the Laureate Online Language School, we were having students from multiple institutions collaborating virtually. And at UPC, they were all from the same place. And uh, it's interesting um, to consider uh, uh, what impact that, that has. Is it, is it more difficult for students who really don't know each other in their context to um, get that comfort level to communicate or not? Some other findings here, um, time zones are a substantial challenge. Obviously at UPC that wasn't a problem, and, we, and as we've seen that the, um, uh, the, the, the student talking time was higher at, 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 at UPC where we didn't have to deal with time zones. Um, we can't rely on students being familiar or comfortable with this technology. Um, and I think it's, you know, the cognitive load goes up when you're trying to get the students to figure technology out and then asking them to produce language at the same time. Hence the zero week, which we use to try and, and, and counteract that, that, that problem. Eric? Yeah, okay. So to, to some extent, I think we, we achieved what we set out to achieve in terms of evaluating asynchronous lessons with regards to student talking time. Now one thing that we recognize, perhaps in hindsight, is that we're not actually sure what that means. Okay, so we've got these points here. We've, we have observations as to how students behave at different levels, different stage of the process, and that, of the language learning process. But one of the next things, really, that we feel we should probably explore is what does this mean? Um, namely, we want to test the assumption that this is a good thing. Okay, so in this, we've got the synchronous lessons where students now feel comfortable, the teacher feels comfortable, the students are talking with each other. Does this actually bring any benefit? Um, and in a way, you could say that our assumptions sprung up out of the whole notion of communicative language teaching. Um, we've got two questions there. Is that proven? Is it proven that a lot of student talking time in the classroom is beneficial? Um, secondly, does that translate, do any benefits that do accrue there translate into the online environment. So this is something that we'd need to test. Um, issues around all of this is that with all of this research there are so many parameters and you, it's very hard to, to be able to say that was a deciding factor over that one. Um, we were talking about motivation as well. Do you want to say something about being compulsory versus being uh, versus not. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a, a big point that we were seeing is um, uh, when we made the synchronous sessions optional, uh, it, we really did see a, a, a major decline in, in, in attendance. Now, um, when, we've, when we've now moved in the, uh, in the next semester, when we're introducing the new, the new pilot, UPC took a strategic decision to make the synchronous sessions mandatory. And um, uh, we will then um, uh, be able to really, really see um, uh, what the impact of that, of that will be. Yeah. So in a way, I think what we'll, what we'll need to do is run a number of cohorts um, with very tight parameters, mandatory, not mandatory, number of hours spent in synchronous lessons versus asynchronous study, and so on. Um, this kind of harks back to the very beginning of our partnership where um, previous to deploying blended learning, the student's learning performance was measured, you know, with the old-fashioned way of teaching, if you like, purely face-to-face. -face. And then over the next two, three, four, five years, um, students coming out of a blended learning approach, their outcome was measured, and their correlation could then be, could then be formed. Effectively, we need to replicate that as well for this with type Yeah, parameters. that's a good point. I mean, student outcomes, that's the next step also that we want to, we want to take a look at. As Eric pointed out, we, we did um, do benchmarking um, studies of the blended cohorts that we have versus the entirely traditional face-to-face -face classes. And we did see in those, in those um, benchmarking studies that there was a significant improvement in, um, in, in student outcomes as measured against a, um, a, a University of Cambridge um, benchmark benchmarking test. Um, we haven't measured those outcomes for the 100% online cohort. So that is something that we intend to do also in the next follow-up um, uh, research in, in, with these cohorts. Okay, so that, that's a key point. Um, the other thing that we really need to do is, is focus on and, and evaluate qualitative data versus quantitative. Um, as, the, as the four researchers were observing these lessons, um, I think it's fair to say that the, the numbers um, didn't always necessarily reflect what they would consider to be 
particularly good teaching. So there might be some lessons where there's lots of student-to-student -student interaction, but that didn't necessarily mean that a lot of learning took place. Um, so that's a sort of qualitative evaluation that we'll, we'll need to integrate as well. Um, yep, which speaks to that. So evaluating what constitutes a good lesson and why. And then a key aspect, obviously, is to measure long-term attainment and ideally, we would like to compare this to other types of learners, whether it's more, you know, totally traditionally face-to-face -face learners only, or um, learners taking part in a more traditional blended type of approach. Another thing we need to look at is dropout rates. Um, I mean, you were, you were just saying as you were, uh, that as soon as it's not mandatory, students don't necessarily attend, take them as seriously, perhaps, why is that? Can that be addressed? Yeah. One of the final points that we'd like to take into account or observe as well is, um, did teachers implement the techniques that they learned on the teacher training course? Um, there are techniques that can be deployed in the online classroom that just don't work in the face-to-face. -face. Did they use them? Or, as soon as they were in their sort of comfort zone, they were in front of their webcam, the students were online, did they just slip effectively back into face-to-face -face classroom mode, forgetting or leaving aside the additional techniques that they'd been taught? Yeah, and if I can just add to that, one of the initiatives that we have for this year is to um, work on a follow-up to what we call our blended initial tra teacher training for, the, for, for e moderation. We feel that at this point, these cohorts of teachers now need to get a follow-up professional development, and, uh, and, and, and perhaps even you know, by having the ability to look at the videos themselves to uh, address the, um, uh, the, the issue of the... Of the the, what, what was the perceived methodology and what actually happened in the, um, in the classroom. Okay, another big thing that we need to evaluate, which we weren't able to in the past but are able to now, that we can record what happens in the breakout rooms, um, is the effective, effectiveness of what happens there. So just a bit of background, so what tended to happen was that the, the teacher would set an instruction effectively go off in pairs and do the, do the following task. They would go into the breakout rooms, but that wasn't monitored. It wasn't possible to monitor that. Now it will be, able, uh, it will be possible. That's right. um, so, you know, it, it appeared that a lot of communication was going on in the breakout rooms, but we had no way of knowing of whether that was in Spanish or in English, whether it was on topic or not, and so on. Okay. That's what we wanted to say to you. So over to you now, please. Any, any questions or, or comments from your side? Can I ask a question? Please how do. How many students were covered in this program? Number of students? How many, number, how many students in total? <coughs> in, the, in the entire, um, in, in, in the, uh, in, in the entire uh, uh, pilot? Um, do you remember, Laura, the exact number? I think there were about, um, in the Laureate Online Language School, we had about um, 650 who started the, um, the pilot. And on UPC, I can't remember the exact number. I don't know the full number that was enrolled. I only know how many I saw attending the lessons. Okay. So, yeah, we have to make that distinction. Enrolled in the, uh, in the entire course, of course, the asynchronous environment and the synchronous environment, I believe we had somewhere along the lines of 1,500 students that were, that were involved altogether. How many of them successfully completed the course? Uh, how many successfully completed the course? There must have been an evaluation in the beginning and an evaluation in the end. Right. So how many, what was the success rate of the Yes, yeah, so in the case of the um, Laureate Online Language School, we started with about 650 students that were there. And of that, I believe uh, approximately 300 students completed the course. And they completed the course with either distinction, high distinction, or just a, a normal, normal pass. Um, I'd have to look at the data for UPC on that to see what, um, uh, what the attrition, uh, what, not the attrition rate, but what the pass rate.
rate was. Um, and uh, if you want to approach me afterwards, I can, I can give you my contact and I'll get you the UPC data um, as well. But in the cohorts for the Laureate um, Online Language School, just, it's an interesting thing when you're doing faculty and staff training like this, you're working with HR departments. And one thing that we found out here was that some HR departments uh, would approach their um, uh, faculty and staff and say, oh, congratulations, uh, you've just been signed up for a, an online language course. And they're like, oh, really? Thank you very much. I'm going on vacation or something like that. So we, we realized that there was also some communication there. So although the rate is like 50% overall completion, we feel now we've learned a lot in the first pilot about how to address those students coming in and make sure that they're there. And I think we can bring that number, number down considerably. There's a question over there. And what was the, the asynchronous work that they did and how did it relate to the, the synchronous class? Do you want to take that? Yeah. Um, so the asynchronous work... Question. Yeah. What was the asynchronous work that was performed and how did it relate to the synchronous lessons? So the asynchronous work was um, using the course materials produced by Cambridge University Press in the learning management system, um, which was a... It's a fully blendable course, so it depended on the teacher. Um, it, it lends itself to either a flipped learning approach where, where the students either do the input part asynchronously and then the synchronous lessons were focused on, um, on production skills and on consolidating what they've learned in the asynchronous material or the other way around. Um, Laura, can you comment on, on the balance between the, the two approaches? Uh, ish. Ish, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Laura, Laura, let me give you a microphone. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, it was quite difficult to see any level of integration between the synchronous and the asynchronous parts because for this particular research study, we were just focusing on the synchronous lessons. So we weren't following, um, again, with these research questions in mind, we weren't following along that track. What we did see was um, an element of creativity in the teacher's synchronous lessons when referring back to the asynchronous work. So sometimes they would use an activity which came from the course material in the synchronous environment, um, but it hadn't been designed to bespoke for that environment because when the course was designed, we never envisaged it being blended in this way. So there was an element of linking, but I couldn't quantify it because that wasn't the focus of this research project. It's something we might look at in future. But well, actually, that's a very good question because it, it feeds into the notion of fixing, locking down as many parameters as possible. Mm -hmm. So in, the in one of the next iterations, we should really say, okay, in this cohort must use the flipped approach, preloading the input stuff uh, asynchronously and then using the synchronous time for productive practice or the other way around. And, and that's a significant point because one of the things we've seen around our network of universities, not just this UPC, you need to understand that the blended learning approach is, is, is spread out across our entire, in our, our entire network. And I think that we're in, depending on the university, depending on the cohort of teachers, we're in different phases of blended learning. So there are indeed a, a number of um, uh, very proficient teachers who are successfully flipping their classrooms, but there's also also a, a large segment of, of, of teachers who, while they blend the materials, um, they would arguably go, be going into a synchronous classroom with still a very traditional mindset of, I, I'm, I'm going to use the uh, synchronous um, uh, time to teach again, yeah, and this is, uh, and, and whether it's a synchronous classroom or it's in a blend with a face-to-face -face classroom, that's one of the things that we're working on um, uh, quite a bit, is to bring those teachers along to truly flip that, that classroom, you know, we, we can't just turn on, the, turn on the lights and say it's flipped by any means. Can I, can I add to that, um, Gordon? Sure. That there were some um, recordings of synchronous lessons that we watched where Again, I couldn't see what they'd done in the, in the asynchronous um, part of the course, but the teacher would begin by commenting on how some of the students present hadn't completed their work mm -hmm. in the asynchronous part. So even if they would have liked to have used that lesson time very communicatively and, and getting the students practicing, they wouldn't actually be reviewing because some of the students hadn't covered the thing they were meant to have done, which of course is an issue in a, in a regular classroom too. So there's, you know, coming back to meeting the pedagogic challenge, it would be lovely if everyone was always doing the bit they were meant to do at the time they were meant to do it and then meeting, and, but it doesn't always work that way. So um, that's something else that we have to consider when we're trying to evaluate the, the, 
the purpose and the quality of those synchronous sessions is the context. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Yes. Do you have any ways of finding out whether the fact that the sessions were recorded actually inhibited communication? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just to repeat the question, do we have any way of finding out whether the fact that the lesson was being recorded inhibit, inhibited student interaction? I can't think... Oh, I suppose we could observe a lesson without recording it, but that would be the same effect. You, I mean, it's, as soon as... Uh, I mean, that, that, it's, it's an ancient question, isn't it? You know, as soon as an observer is in a classroom, does that change classroom behaviour? I mean, in the fact, with the synchronous classroom, I mean, it, it, it's not as uh, overt as if you were to attend that class physically and, and, and walk in and observe. So it's, a, it's very much, um, it's, it's not necessarily visible. All of the teachers and the students had to sign video release forms so they're aware of the fact that they could be recorded. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, I don't even know which they, they would realize which sessions were being recorded or not. Um, I think as a rule they were all recorded, but they weren't all submitted to us as researchers. Right. I can only comment anecdotally that I think people tended to forget they were being recorded because of things we occasionally saw in the recordings. <laughs> so, students you know, reclining in bed with their iPhone. Or um, in one of the lessons there was an earthquake, and I don't think anybody cared they were being watched because they just stopped everything going, wait, teacher, did you feel that? Because they were in the same country. I mean, so it, it's anecdotal, but I think like with a lot of things, once you get into the habit, people just forget that it's there anyway. Uh, I suppose what one assumption could be, I mean, one of the outcomes that we saw was as the semester progressed, there was more student interaction is that because they forgot that, that they were being observed? Or was that because they were more confident with the whole environment, with the whole method of learning? I'm not sure that's one we'll be able to crack. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it there. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, if our, our, whoops, there are our details. Um, if you'd like to, or catch us afterwards. And also, if you go to the Cambridge stand, which is 65 or 67, um, you can get the slides as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.